Benjamin Franklin proposed that to keep youth in health and strength and render active their bodies, they be frequently exercised in running, leaping, wrestling, and swimming. 215 years later, at the end of the first century of intercollegiate athletics at the University of Pennsylvania, we can proudly say we have kept faith with our founding father. This is Franklin Field, home of University of Pennsylvania football, birthplace of the Penn Relays. Two Pennsylvanians whose athletic feats here will never be forgotten are a father and son, Barney Burlinger Sr. and Barney Burlinger Jr. Let's let them speak for Pennsylvania athletics. Intercollegiate athletics at Pennsylvania didn't begin with football or on Franklin Field. It began with a cricket match May the 7th, 1864. Pennsylvania played at Haverford and lost 89 to 60 in a one inning match terminated by darkness. Football went intercollegiate on November 11th, 1876 when Pennsylvania met Princeton for the first time. Pennsylvania's intercollegiate track competition can be traced to 1875, and intercollegiate baseball dates from Pennsylvania's sophomore game that same year. Pennsylvania pioneered in college basketball and met Yale in its first intercollegiate game in 1897. Today, the university fields teams in 14 men's and nine women's sports, is a member of the Ivy League, and carries on a vast physical education and intramural sports program for the benefit of the entire student body. Pennsylvania is concerned today, as was Franklin during the university's earliest days, with the education of the whole man, his experience in the classroom, in campus life, and on the athletic field. Today, as it was 100 or 215 years ago, Pennsylvania's aim is to provide its students with a complete education an important part of this is keeping them in health and strength and making active their bodies. Football is first on the sports calendar each year in Pennsylvania. On President's Day, the university honored Dr. Gaylord P. Harnwell's 10th anniversary. Dr. Harnwell tosses the coin before the opening kickoff against Dartmouth. A full varsity Ivy League schedule is supplemented by junior varsity, 150 pound and freshman competition. Participants in the intercollegiate schedule now total approximately 200 students, with intramural touch football adding 750 more. In football, as in other athletics, we're reminded that sports for all at Pennsylvania dates back to 1904 and Dr. R. Tate McKenzie, when the university initiated its physical education program for all students. At Pennsylvania, students compete with a chance of winning against teams from schools with similar academic and athletic policies. On homecoming weekend, play begins early in the morning when the junior varsity and the 150-pound squads take over the river fields until noon. Neither the size of the players nor the number of spectators seems to reduce the team's spirit. The homecoming varsity game is always a crucial one, as eyes of the past view every player from a vantage rich with memories. There's the halftime presentation of the homecoming queen, Miss University, and her court of attendants, Miss Candy Bergen of Hollywood, California. An added fillet this particular day was a chariot race designed to provide diversion, if not a test of speed and steed. With increasing national emphasis on physical fitness, the freshman men's physical efficiency tests assume increased importance. All incoming freshmen are tested against certain performance standards in push-ups on the parallel bars, jump and reach, chinning, and running a maze. In Hutchinson Pool, all freshmen are required to swim 100 yards prone and 50 yards on their backs. For early detection of students with heart defects, radiocardiographic facilities have been set up at Hutchinson Gymnasium. Students are selected at random for testing certain phases of their heart action during exercise. For hyperreactors, a preventive program and additional tests may be indicated. Medically normal students who fail to pass the physical efficiency tests are assigned to conditioning classes where they remain under closely supervised physical education instruction until they are able to meet the university's requirements. Those meeting fitness standards may select a recreational sport 
or advanced instruction such as that provided in this life-saving and swimming class. Other options are volleyball, handball, fencing, tennis, and unarmed defense. All students are required to take one year of physical education. Pennsylvania's present soccer program reflects a long record of successes dating from 1905 and Coach Douglas Stewart. Here, the red and blue meets white jerseyed Yale. Under Coach Charles Scott, Pennsylvania has produced such soccer All-Americans as Lou Buck in 62, Richard Williams in 58, and Joe Devaney in 52. Pennsylvania has been represented on eight of the last 10 All-American soccer teams. The red and blue shared Ivy League soccer titles with Harvard in 1955 and 1962. Girls gather on the new women's residence fields on an autumn or spring afternoon to improve and test their skill with the bow and arrow. These same fields provide improved areas in the fall for women's field hockey and again in the spring for their lacrosse and softball schedules. Intercollegiate competition prevails in all three sports, while archery and softball are also offered as physical education activities. Basketball at Pennsylvania grew from the untiring efforts of Ralph Morgan, a determined and dedicated young man. Now 80 years old, Morgan on the right reminisces with Gordon Hardwick during ceremonies inaugurating Pennsylvania's intercollegiate athletics and tennis. Morgan also founded the Collegiate Basketball Rules Committee in 1905 and drew up the eligibility code for the Eastern Intercollegiate College Basketball Association. Today, basketball at Pennsylvania means the palestra, the nation's center for top bracket court competition, such as this close 1963 victory over a stubborn Yale Five. Under coach Jack McCloskey, Pennsylvania turns out Ivy League teams that more than hold their own with opponents of national prominence. International recognition came to a Pennsylvania court star when basketball captain John Weidman was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship. All winter long in Hutchinson Gym, intramural teams work out and compete in a schedule now accommodating more than 1,200 men. And basketball, mind you, is only one of 14 sports in which fraternity and dormitory teams meet in this iviest league of all. Officiating and instruction are provided by the Department of Physical Education under its director, George Munger. He perpetuates the tradition of leadership established by the man who first held his position, R. Tate McKenzie, whose portrait shown here hangs in the director's office. Hutchinson Pool has been the center of intercollegiate swimming competition in Pennsylvania since 1927. Today, it's the site not only of varsity team meets with members of the Ivy League, such as Dartmouth, shown here, and the Eastern Intercollegiate Swimming League, but is used for physical education and recreational swimming by both graduate and undergraduate students and other members of the university family. Hutchinson Pool is in use summer and winter, night and day, seven days a week. Boys and girls aged 9 to 15 compete each winter in the Philadelphia Indoor Diving Championships in Hutchinson Pool. This 14-year-old is already the women's Middle Atlantic diving champion. These are Penguinettes, four of the 45 to 50 synchronized swimmers in the university's physical education program for women. All freshman women at Pennsylvania must complete satisfactorily one course of dance. But many who come into the program under Malvina Tays with little more than determination progress to the advanced dance group and participation in many university programs scheduled during the academic year. Unarmed defense across between judo and karate is pursued under the watchful eye of Coach Melvin Furman, president of the National Society for Unarmed Defense. More than 100 boys have enrolled for two hours a week of this sort of beating for the full 15-week term. This is not the gentle art of unarmed defense. Maestro Lajos Chisar, Pennsylvania's fencing coach and an American Olympic coach, brings the highest quality competitive and coaching experience to Pennsylvania's fencers. Under Chisar, interest continues high as more than 100 students make fencing their choice for physical education. The flashing red, green, and white lights behind Coach Chisar indicate touches. 
Pennsylvania's winter track received a boost when Varsity Club President D. Hughes Kaufman presented a $5,000 check to President Harnwell. The contribution permitted purchase of a new pine track, forming an oval 1 11th of a mile in circumference and a straightaway to accommodate 60-yard dashes and hurdles. The freshman polar bear meet is an annual March event on the Pennsylvania sports calendar. Varsity aspirants from Columbia, Princeton, and Pennsylvania meet in the raw late winter air for a complete schedule of field and track events. Competition in events like this two-mile run give freshman hopefuls a chance to test their mettle and give their coaches a preview of their potential for the varsity years ahead. Squash and tennis at Pennsylvania are under the supervision of Coach Al Malloy. Squash activity is centered in the new Ringe Squash Courts completed in 1958 and dedicated to Thomas B.K. Ringe, 1923 class president. Here, Pennsylvania's squash varsity meets for practice and instruction. These courts are also available to the student body. Competing as members of the Ivy Squash League, Pennsylvania varsity teams are privileged to play in one of the outstanding squash centers in the East. Wally Johnson Wright became Pennsylvania tennis coach in 1929 after 20 years of top amateur competition. He won both the National Interscholastic and Intercollegiate Singles Championships and was a member of the United States Davis Cup team in 1913. His bid for the National Singles title in 1921 was topped by none other than Big Bill Tilden. Now at the age of 75, Johnson still maintains an active interest in Pennsylvania's tennis and squash teams. These new palestra courts, a gift from the class of 34, the varsity club and other friends of tennis, provide nearly ideal conditions for varsity competition. John Reese, 1964 national intercollegiate singles champion, completed the preceding season winning nine and losing but one match for Pennsylvania. Bailey Brown, here a junior, won the Eastern Intercollegiate Singles as a freshman and teamed with Reese to win the doubles. In 62, they won the ECAC doubles championships. In the 62 and 63 seasons, Pennsylvania tennis teams have won more than two-thirds of their matches. If you like success stories in Pennsylvania athletics, golf is another place to look. Since 1947, under coach Bob Hayes, Pennsylvania golf teams have won 74% of their matches. Pennsylvania won the Ivy League Golf Championship in 1960. In 64, the team won 10 and lost only one match. Franklin Field is the scene each spring of the University of Pennsylvania Relay Carnival, an outgrowth of Pennsylvania's greatest contribution to intercollegiate track, the relay race now a great tradition in American athletics. The Penn Relays have served as a model for sectional relay carnivals in every part of the United States. They prompted the International Olympic Association to include the relay as a feature of its quadrennial games. In 1895, at the first relays, 10 Eastern colleges and six preparatory and high schools from the Philadelphia area participated. At the 70th Annual Carnival in 1964, 113 colleges sent athletes to Franklin Field. Entrants both collegiate and scholastic totaled more than 5,000. Recent relay carnivals have included teams from as far west as Oregon and Texas and from as far south as Florida. The relays have played host to teams from Oxford, Cambridge, and the University of Paris. University of Pennsylvania athletes have won more relay championships of America than those from any other college or university. Important traditionally at every relay carnival is the heptagonal mile. This event brings together the eight Ivy League adversaries plus teams from Annapolis and West Point. The annual Child's Cup race with Columbia and Princeton is an event of special significance in Pennsylvania sports. The Child's Cup race inaugurated rowing at the university. 
The year was 1879, the date June 24th, and Pennsylvania won, defeating a Columbia Four that had been victorious at Henley the preceding year. Today, Child's Cup competition continues, now in the eight-oared shell with Coxon, adopted in 1891, and including junior varsity and freshman races. This is home year for the Child's Cup, but whether Pennsylvania is hosting the Child's, Adams, or Blackwell Cup competition, the stands at the finish line and the banks of the school kill are always crowded with sports-minded students. It's a colorful event and a wonderful tradition in a setting of lush green foliage and sparkling sunlight. Red and blue, orange and black, blue and white, streaking down the river in a relentless rhythm. And suddenly it's over. All that's left is complete exhaustion with oars lying limp on the water, strength spent in a glorious effort of cooperation and coordination. The Pennsylvania Boathouse was built in 1872, seven years before that first Child's Cup race. It's here that crewmen, freshmen, junior varsity and varsity, lightweight and heavyweight, meet each fall with coach Joe Burke. It's here the long practice sessions begin and end. The shells are lifted from their racks and carried out on the dock. On crisp fall afternoons, in the frosty winter air when the school kill is a half a degree from freezing, in the spring and in the oppressive heat of early summer, you will find the crews on the river. Intensive practice, a tradition with Pennsylvania crews, started with Coach Ellis Ward in 1879. And it's this tradition that has contributed greatly to the university's continuing success under such great rowing mentors as the late Rusty Callow and now Joe Burke. spring, the more than 150 crew candidates that turned out in the fall have been narrowed down to 70 or 75 earnest and conditioned athletes. Now, practice assumes added importance for the racing season is at hand. With the end of the spring term in early May, the training sessions are stepped up to two a day, the first in the early morning and the regular practice in mid-afternoon. The full length of the Schoolkill racing course is traversed in practice, all the way from above Strawberry Mansion Bridge to the finish line and down to the boathouse. Even though you're dog tired when you're through, the shell must be lifted from the water and prepared for tomorrow's early morning practice. But you're one day nearer to the IRAs, perhaps Henley, and who knows, maybe even the Olympics. The renovation of the university's river fields will provide a new varsity baseball diamond and two additional football fields. The old steam plant in the background will be remodeled into a Riverfield Sports Center. The new baseball diamond was dedicated May 9, 1964 in ceremonies inaugurating the 100th anniversary of intercollegiate athletics at the university. This was 100 years and two days after that fateful cricket match at Haverford. President Harnwell welcomed a distinguished luncheon audience of Pennsylvania's former athletic greats and presented a dedicatory plaque to the undergraduate varsity club. 
After the luncheon, many of Pennsylvania's baseball veterans gathered on the new diamond for an old-timers batting practice. The batting order recalled memories of some of the Pennsylvania baseball teams of yesteryear. Nineteen thirteen left fielder Dr. George Coleman with coach Jack McCloskey on the mound. George Gordon, catcher in 1913. And G. Foster Sanford, pitcher, captain in 1928. Then with the alumni and their families watching from the stands, the red and blue varsity took the field for their annual game with the Harvard Crimson. of the game was this two-run homer in the third inning by Pennsylvania captain Ray Carrazzo. That's the sports year at Pennsylvania today. Intercollegiate, intramural, and in physical education. But as much as you've seen, there is still more. Lacrosse, women's field hockey, wrestling, handball, volleyball, softball, badminton, and bowling. Have I missed any? Yes, four. Rugby, sailing, women's paddle tennis, and ice hockey. Ice hockey is still a club sport, as were so many of the others in their early days. But student interest in the future may change that. Since 1895, 49 Pennsylvania football players have been voted All-American. Among them are T. Truxton Hare, Bill Hollenbach, E. Leroy Mercer, George C. Thayer, Jr., Paul T. Scott, Bob O'Dell, Chuck Bednarik, Jack L. Shanafelt. Throughout Pennsylvania football history, some men will always be remembered for one particular play or game. The longest run back of a kickoff in Pennsylvania's football history occurred against Notre Dame in 1955. Pennsylvania's Frank Ripple took the opening kickoff deep in his own end zone. With the aid of good blocking and elusive running, he went 107 yards for a touchdown, outmaneuvering Notre Dame's famed Paul Horning, number eight, in a race for the goal line. In 1947, Tony Manissi was one of three Pennsylvanians chosen for All-American honors. Here in the 46 Dartmouth game, he takes off on this 65-yard touchdown jaunt. In 1940, trailing Cornell 14 to nothing, Pennsylvania bounced back to a 22 to 20 victory. Here, All-American Frank Reagan fakes a pass and goes in for the touchdown. In 1952, two-time All-American Ed Bell surprised a highly favored Notre Dame as he grabbed this pass from Glenn Adams on the Notre Dame 30, completing a 65-yard play for the tying touchdown. Bagnell captained a winning 1950-11. In the Pennsylvania Dartmouth game, he set a national intercollegiate total yardage record for one player in one game that still stands, 490 yards. <laughs> Pennsylvania won its first official Ivy League crown in 1959. Captain Barney Berlinger, Jr. adds six to make the score 28 to 13 against Cornell. In the University Hall of Fame, some are remembered not primarily as athletes, but for their part in forwarding the cause of athletics at Pennsylvania. 
Among these were H. Lawsot J. Lan, the first man to wear the red and blue. Frank B. Ellis, originator of the pen relays. Dr. R. Tate McKenzie, the first director of physical education at Pennsylvania. McKenzie is remembered best as a sculptor of athletic subjects. Most familiar is the pen relay medal. 62 Pennsylvania athletes have earned the right to wear the United States Olympic team insignia. In providing Olympians, Pennsylvania ranks among the first five schools in the nation. A.C. Krenzlein was the only winner of gold medals in four Olympic individual events. This 1900 Pennsylvania Olympic squad accounted for a total of nine gold medals. And Ted Meredith, whose 1912 Olympic record in the 800 meter run stood for 16 years. Pennsylvania international competition has not been limited to the Olympics. This 1955 red and blue eight in white jerseys defeated Vancouver and brought home the Henley Grand Challenge Cup. Joe Burke, Pennsylvania coach who guided this 1955 eight to victory, is himself a 1939 Sullivan Award winner. He's a two-time Henley Diamond Skulls champion, winning in 1938 and 39, and was selected for the 1940 Olympics, canceled by World War II. At Henley again in 1949, John B. Kelly Jr. won the Diamond Skulls for the red and blue. This followed his first Olympic singles competition in 1948. Jack Kelly, another Sullivan Award winner, has competed in four Olympiads, more than any other Pennsylvania athlete. The trophy is presented to Kelly by Lady Churchill, wife of Sir Winston Churchill. In 1932, little Bill Carr made Olympic and Pennsylvania athletic history with his record-breaking win in the 400 meters. Here, Carr is anchoring the Pennsylvania team to victory in the Mile Relay Championship of America in the 1932 Penn Relays, setting a Pennsylvania team record that was to stand for 32 years to be broken by the 1964 team at the IC4As. In 1956, the University of Pennsylvania made a lovely as well as talented contribution to the American Olympic squad. Her name, Karen Anderson, her specialty, the javelin. That same year, John Haynes, although eliminated in the Olympic trials, set an all-time record by winning the National AAU Indoor Sprint Championship for the fourth time. This is a record that still stands. In 1952, this trim young mermaid in the near lane, then Mary Freeman, now the wife of John B. Kelly Jr., was part of the five-member Olympic squad from Pennsylvania. In the 1930s, two great milers vied for track honors, Pennsylvania's Gene Bensky and Kansas' Glenn Cunningham. On February 22, 1936, in New York, Bensky beat his rival in the 1,500-meter run while setting a new world mark for the distance. Bensky passed Cunningham at the final turn and went on to win. He represented Pennsylvania and the United States at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. The Berlinger family is a living sports tradition at the University of Pennsylvania, and it all started with Barney Berlinger Sr. He was decathlon representative on the 1928 United States Olympic team, three-time Penn Relay decathlon champion, and winner of the Sullivan Award in 1931. This action was filmed when Berlinger was at the peak of his winning decathlon form. myself as I was 30 years ago, I know how time changes all things. Now, since we've dealt with the past and the present, let's take a look into the future for a report on the university's plans for that future. Let's move into the lounge of the J. William White training house at the northwest entrance to Franklin Field. And here we meet University President Harnwell. The first thing that we owe our students, those who are athletically gifted and those who are not, is the best education that we can give them. But education at Pennsylvania is more than teachers and books. It's a meeting of minds and personalities from throughout the United States and 85 other countries. 
more than that. It's a bringing together of the energies, the spirit, and the skills of the most vigorous element of our society. Youthful spirits demand a meaningful outlet. The physical skills and stamina of our youth are a national resource that we must foster. This is why we at Pennsylvania regard competitive athletics and physical recreation as an integral part of the life of our community. It is why we count as an educational investment the cost of maintaining extensive programs of both intramural and intercollegiate athletics. What is worth doing is worth doing well. The desire to excel and the will to win are the spurs to excellence in physical performance. And so along with our new libraries and laboratories, we have also been building the Palestra tennis courts, the new varsity club board track, the ring squash courts, the new baseball diamond at River Fields, and more comfortable sleeping quarters on the upper floors of this training house. These are but the beginning of a new era of athletic development at Pennsylvania. And let us look at the campus as we envision it in the 1970s. And especially at the new athletic facilities we are planning. First, a new physical education building, providing an additional swimming pool, another gymnasium, more squash courts, and more basketball courts. Next to this building will be an ice skating rink. The new swimming pool will be of Olympic size. New areas for intramural competition will be created among the men's residence houses we are preparing to build. Under the house plan, which we are introducing, each house will have its own teams and a place for them to play. To determine more fully our present and future requirements, a committee of the trustees, faculty, and alumni has undertaken a comprehensive survey of the university's athletic and physical education program. Its recommendations are basic to our future development plans. For a hundred years, Pennsylvania's athletic tradition has been interwoven with its academic tradition. On the playing field, as throughout the campus, we see great years ahead for the University of Pennsylvania.